Section 1 of Food Values. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Food Values by Dr. Albert Phillips Sy. In the narrower sense of the term, food value refers to heat or energy, equivalent of proteins, carbohydrates, or fats, or mixtures of these in food materials. In the following pages, a much broader meaning is given to this term. The amount of heat, measured in calories, that may be obtained by burning a food, is only a part of the story of foods. It is an erroneous but still quite prevalent practice to discuss and compare foods on a basis of chemical composition from which calories are calculated. While the composition of a food is perhaps its most important feature, there are many other properties that must be carefully considered before we can estimate the true and complete value of a food. To some people, the value of a food is closely related to its flavor only. Food is good and valuable if it tastes good. Others judge food on a dollar and cents basis. To them, expensive food is synonymous with good food. Still others do not connect value in any sense of the word with foods. Sometimes they eat and think, but most of the time they simply eat. The word values is used in the plural, so that in the following discussion there may be included the different factors which make a food valuable and desirable. Without the proper flavor, a food would be little better than a medicine. Flavor makes food appetizing, and palatability is one of its first requisites. The difference in price as well as digestibility is often due to flavor. Choice cuts of meats, certain kinds of fish or fowl, wines, cheese, all contain some substance or substances which are the key to the whole food problem, so called by H. T. Fink in his interesting and readable book on Food and Flavor. Common observation as well as research experiments prove that, everything else being equal, a food which has a desirable flavor is more readily digested than one which is not palatable. Closely related to the flavor of a food is its odor. In fact, many people believe that what is actually considered to be the flavor tasted is in reality the odor smelled. Such attention is being given to cultivation, production, and preparation of foods so as to produce the most desirable flavors. The flavor of meats is improved by proper feeding of the animals. Cheese is ripened by the addition of bacteria producing certain flavors. Unfertilized hen's eggs have a flavor superior to those fertilized. The appearance of an appetizing food adds greatly to its value. It stimulates the secretion of digestive fluids. One is inclined to believe that foods are often prepared to be photographed rather than eaten, and flavor, as well as other values, seem to be sacrificed for appearance. The value of a food depends in a large measure upon its natural appearance, or its appearance after it leaves the kitchen. Proper cooking, of course, does more than change the appearance of a food. It creates a food value because it changes the composition, flavor, and digestibility. Cooking also destroys germs and other organisms frequently present in uncooked foods. The appearance of a food, such as oleomargarine, may also be improved by coloring, by bleaching, as is done with flour, dyeing, as in the case of candies, mustard, maraschino cherries, and sometimes peas and ketchup, and many others. These improvements in appearance often seriously affect the other properties, and are really adulterations. Certainly, an important factor in making a food valuable is its digestibility. This term is given two meanings. First, the ease or readiness with which a food is digested, i.e. time required. Second, the percentage of digestibility. Some foods are quickly and more or less easily digested, while others leave an indigestible residue. The value of a food to any individual, therefore, depends upon its digestibility and the condition of the individual's digestive tract. Some people can digest very few foods, while others, especially growing children, 
have digestions that rival those attributed to goats and ostriches. Much that is said and written about the medicinal value of foods, especially of vegetables, is sheer nonsense, and most of the remainder is tradition. Chemists have not been able to isolate medicinal substances from vegetables or other foods. For that matter, it would probably involve us in difficulties if we attempted to differentiate between medicines and foods that have a therapeutic value. To read about a medicine-food combination, a sort of two-in-one, is interesting if one is not particular about facts. Tradition has it that celery is loaded with medicine that will heal diseased nerves, and fish is good for brains. Spinach is good for the blood because it contains iron, and iron makes blood. Lettuce is supposed to make one sleep. Some people eat watercress to remove pimples, carrots to prevent dyspepsia, dandelions for the liver, cucumbers to cool the blood, and onions for everything not included in the above. So far as we know, vegetables do not possess specific medicinal properties. However, certain foods, especially vegetables, are an important and necessary part of a well-balanced diet. They contain vitamins and other growth essentials. They are usually rich in desirable mineral matter. They contain desirable water in a highly purified form, which is valuable for digestive processes. And finally, they contain indigestible matter, such as cellulose or woody materials, called crude fiber or roughage, which stimulates peristalsis and regulates bowel action. That foods should be pure is almost axiomatic. Any suspicion or knowledge that our food is not pure immediately suggests adulteration. A food might be called adulterated when it is sold or eaten for something other than as it is labeled, but many foods are properly labeled and yet are most dangerously adulterated, or rather contaminated. Anyone who has ever given a thought to the subject of food adulteration in general, and contamination through unsanitary handling in particular, must be convinced that there is still much need for improvement in food sanitation. A few examples will be sufficient. Think of the possibilities of unwrapped bread becoming contaminated. There must be hundreds of persons engaged in handling foods who have infectious diseases, there are still many quick lunch places where money and food are actually handled by the same person. Save only the medicinal value of foods, this topic, more than any other, tempts amateur food experts to rush into print. Many absurd statements are made about tomaine poisoning. When no other explanation is at hand, almost any kind of digestive disturbance is blamed on tomaines. In the popular mind, Food in tin cans is almost always under suspicion, but tin and tomaine have only the alliteration in common. Under food poisoning, there should be included bacterial contamination, chemical decomposition, accidental addition of metallic or other poisons, deliberate use of poisonous preservatives, eating of substances supposed to be, or mistaken for, foods such as toadstools. We go to specialists for information on every other subject except the one that most vitally concerns us, foods. Apparently everybody who is willing to write or talk about foods becomes a specialist. Many people believe anything they hear or read about foods, and presently become food experts themselves. Almost without exception, what is said about foods in advertisements of food experts, food specialists, patent medicines, and the like, is worse than useless, and should be prohibited by law. Occasionally, but unfortunately not often enough, a food faker is barred from the use of the United States mails. In pleasing contrast are the researches and writings of the real experts in food science. Their number is too large for enumeration here, but mention should be made of a most important series of articles on What We Eat and What Happens to It, by Professor Philip B. Hawk in the Ladies' Home Journal. Much of what Professor Hawk writes is based upon recent researches and experiments by himself and co-workers. The following also are excellent. Dr. H. W. Wiley, Foods and Their Adulteration, 
Our Daily Bread, Articles in Good Housekeeping, Dr. Woods Hutchinson, We and Our Children, numerous other books and magazine articles. Alexander Bryce, Modern Theories of Diet. Fisher and Fisk, How to Live. E. Puritan, Efficient Living. Dr. Percy Stiles, An Adequate Diet. Dr. Lafayette B. Mendel, Changes in the Food Supply and Their Relation to Nutrition. Bulletins, Cornell Reading Course for Farm Home, Ithaca, New York. United States Government Bulletins, Department of Agriculture, Washington, D.C. The most important progress in food science during recent years is due to the discovery of certain substances, as yet unidentified, and which are necessary for the maintenance of growth. The name growth essentials seems most appropriate. Other terms used are growth determinants, food accessories, accessory factors, growth regulators. They occur in many foods, not in all, and a number of classes of growth essentials are known. Vitamins are unidentified substances present usually in very small amounts, found principally in fresh fruits and vegetables, grains, eggs, milk, meats, and brewer's yeast and yeast extracts. The continued use of a diet practically free from vitamins is believed to be the cause of such disorders as beriberi, scurvy, etc., called nutritional disorders or deficiency diseases. Vitamins are water-soluble and are more or less destroyed when heated. This means that vitamins are often lost during the process of cooking, and that foods must be eaten raw in order to get the greatest benefit of the vitamins. Of course, certain foods cannot be eaten raw on account of the indigestibility of some of their components. Vitamins are removed from certain foods by special treatment, such as the polishing of rice, which removes practically all of the vitamins. Fat-soluble A. This is the name given to growth essentials found associated with fats or the fatty part of a food. In their physiological effect, they resemble vitamins, but as the name indicates, they are not soluble in water, only soluble in fats. Mineral matter. This could properly be classed as a growth essential. Experiments have shown that a diet free from mineral matter soon causes serious nutritional disturbances. Amino acids. Proteins are complex chemical compounds consisting mainly of chemically united amino acids. Most protein molecules contain probably 18 or more of these acids. The proteins of the human body are formed from the amino acids obtained by the digestion of food proteins. But a food protein, in order to be suitable for building body proteins, must contain certain amino acids. If these are not present in the food, then the proteins of the latter are not complete and are inadequate for building up body proteins. End of section 1